Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Kali Ipe and this is Violence Free World. We are continuing our conversation with Chief Femi Fani Kayade, very, 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 very interesting personality. Chief, you're welcome to our program again. Thank you very much. Now it's time to go straight and continue the conversation. Now, we were talking about dialogue, generally. Dialogue you've had behind closed doors, mm. dialogue you've had in uh, even the public spaces. I remember you and I were on the same stage at uh, during GYB's um, 46th birthday. That was it at Lokoja, your friend. I'm referring to Governor Yaya Bello. Now, situate all of these things that you've been doing on the side and what you came there to do on that particular day. Yeah, I agree you came to felicitate with your friend, support him. But now, let's situate what you've done well. You were talking to me about the last episode on your relationship with Sunday Ibuho, and then there's, Khan, uh, there's um, even Nandi Kano on this other side too, all of your friends, and then things are going on, and there's a sudden twist about you. Uh -huh. You are a friend of the government presently, and they are enemies of this government, so to speak, supposedly. Please speak to this issue. First of all, I don't see it in terms of enemies and friends. I really don't. I see it in terms of we agree on issues, we disagree on issues. It doesn't make you my enemy. And because we agree doesn't make you my friend. There are some people, like Yaya, who is my friend, and a number of others, any day, any time. Sunday is my friend and will always be my friend, even if we disagree on a lot of issues. The same with Namdi Kano and so on and so forth. I never, ever uh, turn my back on somebody that I've once called a friend. We may disagree on issues, we may not take the same approach, on issues, but I never, dis I never ever renounce a friendship. Abakiari was chief of staff in this government for many years. He'd been my friend for 40 years. We, we sat down regularly once a month in the middle of the night discussing government policy, and I disagreed with virtually everything they were doing. But we were friends. It was after he died that I let the whole world know that this man had been my friend for almost 40 years. My brother, not even friend. And I have no enemies. So that's the first thing. I don't have enemies, um, particularly in the political realm. But I, I know how politics works, okay? But before I go into this, um, if you, you will allow me to just go back to something. I, was, I spoke to you about, um, about two reasons why we, 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 we took the course that we took recently. Um, I told you about the issue of the contribution of the governor of Kogi State in terms of bringing peace to the country. And I was impressed with the fact that he could do that. I was impressed with the fact that President Buhari could allow me to participate in that because he got permission from the president before calling me in. And I was delighted with the fact that when we finished that great work, we all went to the villa, we had audience with the chief of staff, he thanked us for the work that we had done. As surprised as he was that we could pull it off, and it was done. That is a credit to the president. That is a credit to the governor of Kogi State. That is a credit to the system that is operating today. We can achieve peace by dialogue and understanding and bringing everybody on board. Now, there was another issue. Uh, there, there are actually six, but I'll only talk about two publicly. There was another major issue which made me realize that, listen, it does work when you sit down and you dialogue and you talk, particularly behind closed doors. What happened in Zamfara State? They've shut down the whole state. They're killing bandits you know, on a daily basis in their hundreds, and people are being freed by these kidnappers. Why? Because they listened, and they allowed people to make contributions to that decision. And Matawali did the right and proper thing and decided that terrorism must be fought. These people must be fought. He's doing the right thing. And that is reflecting everywhere in the Northwest today. For the first time you know, in years, in fact, for the first time ever, a governor like Masari, Masari can get a governor of Katina and say that the people that are commit, committing these crimes are Fulanis from outside Nigeria and people that share the same faith as him. Would you have believed he'd say that three, four months ago? Certainly not. And that is progress because he's I identified the enemy as foreigners. He's not shying away from who and what they are and they're doing something about it. You talk about the governor of Kebi State, for example, another one. He has said these people are not bandits, they are terrorists, and we should call them terrorists. Would you have believed that would happen three or four months ago? Of course you wouldn't have believed it. You say it wouldn't happen, but it has happened. Would you have believed that Matawa would take the steps that he took in Zamfara State, you know, um, fighting these terrorists a few months ago? You wouldn't have believed that. And it's going out throughout the whole of the Northwest. What you see is a concerted effort by all the governors to 
you know, to fight the terrorists head on, to kill them and send them back to wherever they came from. And that is a very positive thing. Now, they could not have done that had it not been for the massive support and encouragement logistically and in terms of security forces that President Buhari has given to them. So the argument that he's the one behind all this all this uh, insurgency and so on and so forth, he's the one behind the terrorists, which we've all put in the past, has been killed by this, in, by this initiative. It has been defeated by this initiative. I know about it. I know what they're doing, and I know the efforts they're making. And that had a huge impact on me in terms of retracing myself and say, listen, I'm prepared to work with anybody that is ready to kill terrorists, that's ready to, to, to fight them and identify them for what they are. That is a very major issue for me, and they've done well in that respect. And it's only a question of time before this is translated to other parts of the country as well. If you look at what's happening in the Southwest now, you'll find that the, the activities of the, of, the, of the terrorists is far less than it was a number, of, a, a number of months and years ago, and so on and so forth everywhere. The new challenge that we're now facing, which is an equally you know, terrible challenge, is the challenge of insurgency in the southeast of the country, which I warned about a long time ago, that we needed to be very careful and sensitive to the situation there. I call it insurgency. I call it complete rebellion, where people will go and target police stations and kill members of the security forces and kill you know, ordinary people, innocent people in the streets and target them. They're not stealing anything. They're not taking anything. They're just killing people. And I think that is absolutely reprehensible and I condemn it. And that, that is the greatest challenge we're facing today, which I sincerely hope, again, we can come together, not just through violence, but also through um, dialogue and understanding and ensure that, um, and ensure that um, you know, it doesn't continue. Uh, the Southwest, the same thing would have happened had it not been for the efforts of, of, of some of us uh, with Sunday Buhu and so on and so forth, who renounced that, completely renounced it, uh, as far as I'm aware. And uh, he did it publicly and privately to me. Um, and, 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 and that I commend him for. Whatever issues he's having with the president and the government today, that's between them. And I sincerely hope it's resolved. But I can tell you, that it would have been much worse in the Southwest had it not been for the sense of restraint he showed at that time when we worked together. Okay, so that, so that, so that's what it is. So these things all coming together, you know, are part of what made me realize that listen, it is better to work with these people to ensure we get a good result. We're getting a good result in the Northwest today. We're getting a good result. It, it, whatever we touch seems to work, and I'm prepared to do that for the sake of Nigeria, rather than tread a path which will lead to division and possibly civil war. Okay, Chief, we're going to come back and talk about your relationship with uh, Muhammad Bari, the way you see him now, as well as many other stalwarts that, um, that when we return from this break. Right, thank you. <laughs> well, Chief, now let's go back to this issue of um, your relationship with Muhammad Bari. Now that you see him differently, would you be willing to work with him to move Nigeria forward? That's not just Muhammad Bari, then. What about Issa Pantami? Uh, Minister of Communication, that you, you're reported to have um, vilified and caught you in the past, antagonized. Now, he, uh, your acquaintances it seem more or less like your friends now. What's going on? What's this sudden uh, back and forth? Well, let me, let me first of all start by answering you in this way. Um, every person that's been on the national scene, and I've been on the national scene in my own right for almost 30 years now, okay? Um, I've been writing, I've been commentating, I've been, I've been saying all sorts, I've fought for people's rights, and I've been a politician for almost 30 years. Never run for elective office, but I will. Now, in the course of that time, you've had differences with so many different people. Differences of opinion, sometimes you speak harshly, sometimes you don't speak harshly. Um, and then at other times, you know, later perhaps you change your position on that person based on what you, you have discovered about them. But most importantly, um, on their own willingness to accommodate your views and work with you. Okay? And that's the key to this. When it comes to the issue of President Muhammad Buhari, it was never anything personal. We had differences, or rather I had differences with him, on a number of issues um, before 2015, during the 2015 election, and between that time and quite up until quite recently. A number of policy issues, policy differences, and the perception that I had was he was fueling certain things which I believe were inimical to the unity of my country, Nigeria. I have no other country. And therefore, I stood my ground and I spoke truth to power, courageously, unlike most people. Okay? When it became clear to me 
that it wasn't quite like that. It was a far more complicated issue. And two things happened, because this is a very profound question you've asked me. Give me a little bit of time to answer it. Two things will happen. A number of things happen, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus on two. The first thing that happened, which impressed me immensely, was the fact that um, many of the APC governors that I started interacting with were very accommodating to me. Uh, they, were, they opened their doors. Uh, we spoke um, from the heart to one another. I told them my views, my challenges in terms of what's going on in the country, why I oppose the government, and so on and so forth. And they came across with a different perspective. And the, instead of instead of um, vilifying and closing doors, they said, look, let's talk. Let's find a way in which we can accommodate one another and perhaps even work together. That's number one. That couldn't have happened without President Buhari giving the go-ahead. That's where it all started. And I thought that was a pretty smart move on his part. And I continued to was smart on my part as well. And that's where all this started. Now, two major issues took place, which really made me now change my mind about where I would stand. The first one was this. We had a situation whereby this country almost came uh, to a civil war, would have, it would have had a civil war, or the beginning of a civil war, uh, a few months ago, six months ago, or thereabouts. A lot of people don't know about this. And a lot of people don't appreciate it because they don't know the facts. Well, let me share some of those facts with you right now. And I stand to be correct that I'm saying this on national television. Okay. I got a call in the middle of the night from the governor of Kogi State. By that time, we had been interacting. And he asked me to join him that we had a bit of a situation and he wanted me to assist. And I, and I gladly went there. This was at the time of the food embargo. And he explained certain things to me privately that, look, we have a major crisis. The president had given three days to resolve the crisis. The food embargo was on and it would not be lifted until this, you know, unless we negotiate and get, you know, get them to stop the food embargo. Um, and that he wanted me to be part of that process. Um, but more importantly, the reason he wanted me there was because elements within the northern part of the country had threatened that they were going to kill southerners. And the, the butchering, the, you know, the killing would start, um, you know, in a matter of days if we didn't do something about it and stop it and talk to the relevant players. Where do I come in? I came in because they wanted me to talk to Sunday Buhu to give a guarantee that if, um, if, no, if, if the Northerners came back down south and started supplying food once again, because at that time, Northerners were leaving the Southwest in drones. Okay? If they came back south and they lifted the food embargo, you know, would there be a guarantee for their safety in the south? And that they wanted me to prevail on this young man because they knew how close and know how close I am to him. And that if that could happen, then perhaps we could now stop this threat of carnage and killing and reprisals. Their argument was that their own people from the north had been killed during the, um, uh, the Lecky, uh, the Lecky um, riots. And uh, also they had been killed during the, the killings in, um, in um, Shasha in, in, in Ivado. So they wanted to do you know, reprisal killings. And he said something which um, touched my heart. He said that the, the federal government would fight to ensure that this was not allowed and that lives were protected in the north, southern lives were protected, but they would take the full might of the federal government to ensure that. So we must sort this problem out in an amicable way and resolve it. We went back into the room and there and then I made the call. I put it on speakerphone, I called Sunday, and I told him, you're on speakerphone, Governor of Kogi State is here with a number of other people. This is the dilemma that I have, that I want you to give a guarantee here and now that if the food embargo is lifted and the, uh, the northerners come back to the south, particularly to the southwest, that you guarantee their safety. And there and then Sunday said, is that what you want, sir? I said, yes. He said, okay, I'm, guarant I'm guaranteeing it. Not only am I guaranteeing it, I will meet them at the border when they come in. I think he said from Kogi State, I don't do or something like that and I'll escort them down and we will ensure that they are well protected. He, sp he said that, he spoke to the governor directly, he spoke to all the other players, about four, four people that were members of the, um, of the unions. He spoke to them as well, and uh, that is how the issue of the uh, food embargo, that's how we began the process of, of negotiating to ensure that that food embargo was lifted, and it was successful. But more importantly is this, the threats that were being made against Southerners in the North, from the minute he gave that guarantee, those threats were now lifted. And the gentlemen that were behind that, some of whom had been detained, I might add, came into the room afterwards and said, no more threats, no more attacks on Southerners. Everything is put on hold because Sunday Boa had given his word and because I sat down 
and we had negotiated this thing. And we made a few calls to a few Southwestern governors there and then and uh, told them what we had done. And that is how we achieved peace. And it occurred to me. Did you did quietly? We did it quietly. We did it behind closed doors. We didn't make noise about it. But what we did do is that, you know, the next three, four days, it was every day. And I have to commend the governor of Gogi State for this. That's why I want immense respect for him. I saw what he was doing. And we were there together. Every day for the next three or four days, he negotiated on behalf of the federal government with these people. And it was a very tough negotiation. A number of issues uh, rose up which they raised. And, 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 and everybody was reasonable. Everybody sat around the table. And at the end of it all, we all agreed. And when we had the final press conference here in Abuja, the, 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 the Northern Unions, all the things that I've just told you, they said it, if people would only listen, that they did this embargo to ensure that there wasn't carnage in the North as a way of appeasing those that wanted to start killing Southerners in the North, and that all of them had stopped, they made a commitment, nothing like that would happen. And that is how we ensure we had peace. If the carnage had started, and they started killing Southerners in the North. Of course, there would have been reprisals in the South. And all, all hell would have broken loose.